Welcome back to Walk with TFB. Tim Bryson here, and as y'all know, I'm a Black millennial who is eager to have and filter conversation with authentic people centered on education, sport, and culture. Today, we are walking with a mentor, uncle, and career readiness educator. A New Jersey native, our guest earned his bachelor's degree in sports studies from Ithaca College. While at Ithaca, he was a walk-on basketball college athlete, club basketball president, pledged Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and was involved with the Brothers for Brothers student organization. His price went up after he earned his master's degree from Ithaca College, while also working in residence life, the Emerging Leaders Academic and Professional Leaders Program, and serving as a graduate assistant for the men's basketball program. He then went on to serve as a student athlete experience intern at Colby College, a position made possible through the NCAA Women and Ethnic Minorities Grant. While at Colby, he revamped the first year college athlete program, restructured the essential, essential documents for both inclusion and leadership, and led comprehensive programming focusing on the holistic development of all Colby college athletes. His experiences led him to Chicago State University and then Northwestern University, where he currently serves as the Assistant Director of Career Enhancement and Employer Relations. His entire career has been dedicated to focusing on diversity and inclusion for college athletes, and that includes career readiness. He's one of the pioneers in all of higher education and college sport, particularly in this arena, and I am elated we get to walk with him today. So without further ado, y'all help me welcome Ahmad Boy. What's poppin' AB? What's good? What's good? It's about time, bro. I'm happy to do this. It's about time, man. It's about time. Yeah, you go by AB, y'all? I do. I actually do. Yeah, that was that's a childhood nickname. Um, so like, everybody call me AB. Even my mom, like it's either mod or AB. So that's what I go by when I'm home. You seen the uh, AB interview on that uh, Full Sin podcast yet? No, nah, I didn't. Oh, you gotta watch it. Yeah, that junk is that junk is hilarious. Nah, I gotta check it out. That junk is hilarious. Talk kumbaya a lot. But no, nah, it, it is about time, bro. And I'm super hyped for this conversation. As I told you before, I've been looking and really brainstorming. And racking my own brain or like who can i talk to about this shit because it's been on my mind for a minute now uh, particularly as it relates to career development challenging traditional ideas historical ideas etc uh, we're definitely going to talk about that not just in segments one two and three uh, but first and foremost yo like what's bringing you black joy right now that's a good question definitely definitely uh therapy so i i know we talked about that a little bit uh a while ago but just being able to really start therapy and start that journey. Uh, it's something I talked about for a long time, something I've seen a lot of people begin to be more open about, you know, reduce the stigma behind, but being able to find um, a therapist who's a black woman um, that I appreciate just having authentic conversations with and, and being able to just open up about things that I experience in everyday life. That's something that's been able to allow me to lift a, a huge load off my plate weekly, bi-weekly, however often we decide to meet um, in a given space. But that's one thing, definitely basketball. I'm a basketball junkie, um, definitely a huge LeBron fan. Lakers are, are turning a tie right now, so that, that's been good. But also just being around family. Like uh, recently, I got the opportunity to go to go home for, for winter break for, for a longer break, one of the longer breaks I've had since working in athletics, and just spend time with, with my mom I, and, and not be on a run. Oftentimes I go home and I drop my bags off, give my mom a kiss, and I go see my boys. Like I go hang out with them. And now because of the COVID and, and trying to be safe and not put her at risk, I was just forced to sit down and just hang out with her. And and it sounds it sounds bad when I say it like that, but it was it was good for me to just sit down and be steady. We watch movies, we talk, we laugh, we joke, and it just reminded me how important family truly is to everything I do, and how that's that's been a pillar of like how I move going forward. Um, and then last but not least, is just like you said, being an uncle. Um, it's one of the greatest experiences I've ever had, and and just having a little person that I love so much and it means so much to me, and, and being able to watch their growth and development uh, from afar because my sister lives in Florida, but it's been amazing, and, and, and that's my heart. And so those are the things that's definitely been bringing me black joy. Love to hear that, yo. And anyone that follows you on Instagram or just or talks to in the regular would, would definitely uh, affirm and confirm everything you just said about uh, not just therapy, but also family and your uncle status as well. Uh, but I'm going to take it to segment one. And as you already know, segment one is entitled What's Your Story? 
And I get so much joy. I feel like I say this shit every week, but so much joy going on Google, <laughs> going through social media, going through LinkedIn. I'm like, damn, I didn't know that. Or damn, I didn't know this was, this came before that. This came after this. Um, and there's a lot of things that came up when I did my research on you. Um, that I'm, I'm excited to see if you bring up on your own. If not, you know, I'm going I'm to pull it in. Uh, but Ahmad, what's your story? Yeah, I'm 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 excited to see like what what you have. Uh, I'm from I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I know if you're not from there, you might pronounce it Newark. But when you're from there, you say Newark. It's N L R K. We laugh about that. From Newark, New Jersey, born uh, to an amazing family. My mom, my dad, my sister. Truly, the the three most important people in my life, and and obviously my niece now. But really big on family from from an early age. Mom and, and my dad just really kind of instill like really important values and. And how important family is, um, not only just in, in life, but how we treat other people as well. And so family has been a huge pillar for, for my development. I grew up in, in Newark and I started playing basketball pretty early. And I was kind of like, I, I, I joke about that because I, playing basketball growing up was my way of being excluded from everything that was happening around me. And so I think me being able to hoop or, or being so focused on hooping, it let the guys in my neighborhood know that. You know, I wasn't going down that path. I wasn't doing all that stuff, but also got, got my respect as well. So I got a lot of passes in the hood just by playing ball. And that was important for me. And so something I, I really stuck with and I kept doing. My mom was a stickler for if you don't bring home the grades you're supposed to. I don't care how much you love basketball. You won't continue in that. And so at a really early age, I kind of instilled the values of education and let me know that if I don't take care of my business in the classroom, everything else that I love and enjoy about my everyday life will be stripped away from me. And she was pretty, she was pretty straightforward on that. My mom don't play. My mom is a, the most kind person, but she don't play when she, when she meet, when she says something. And so being able to really understand uh, the importance of education at an early age was something that created this foundation um, for me to want to strive for more. I have an older sister. She's six years older than me. She went to college and then, you know, left New Jersey to get her master's at a university in Florida. And I always tell people my sister was the most influential person in my life growing up because she was the person I wanted to be like. She was the person that she was better than me at sports growing up. She was a, a genuine person, very nice. Everyone wanted to, to do for her, look out for her. She was extremely, she is extremely smart. And so she just set the bar for everything. And I found myself in, in, in an everyday competition to, to compete with her. I remember my sister coming home and, and telling everybody she made a super honor roll. And so to compete, I was telling people I was, I was Superman, right? Like I was, uh, I had something to, 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 to compete with her, with her. And, but she really drives everything I wanted to do uh, growing up. And so me getting involved in, in church and going to church every Sunday. That was due to my sister being in church, me going to school and, and excelling really well. I wanted to make my sister proud in, in combination with my family as well. Me also pursuing my master's degree. I never uh, I never thought like secondary education was something I wanted to get involved in our, our, our graduate school and watching her do that and excel made me want to pursue that as well. And so I did that. I went to Ithaca College I and I guess I'll take a step back and talk about my process in, in selecting the school. And so I, it was two schools. I was down in my last two. It was Ithaca College and it was Philly Dickinson back in New Jersey. So Philly Dickinson is about 40 minutes from where I grew up and amazing school. I, I think I would have had a great time there, but I took a chance and I drove out to Ithaca, New York, about three or four days before I had to make that, you know, that official decision on where you're going to go to school. And I got lucky, went to Ithaca Upstate and it was the most beautiful day. It was uh, sunny. The campus was shining and I got a black tour guide. I learned that when I got there, that that's not a, that's not something that happens often. Right. So it just was lucky that I got a black tour guide that day and it kind of sealed the deal for, okay, I left school that day. I left campus that day and, and it made the decision. That I'm definitely going to college. So I go there. The one caveat to, to me going there, though, was playing basketball. So at Division three school, I wanted to go there. I wanted to hoop. And the first thing I do was set up a meeting with the head coach. And he tells me, you're more than welcome to try out. However, we have an incoming class of six of six uh, students and four of them are guards. And so another guard right now, it's not what we need. But like I walk an opportunity for you to try out. And so going back to just betting on yourself, I bet on myself. I chose Ithaca and First year is tryouts. I'm in the gym bright and early, thinking I'm going hard. And after two and a half days of tryouts, I got the the most devastating news in my life up until that point, which is that I didn't make the, the the basketball team. And I think 
in that moment, it was the hardest pill to swallow. But when I always reflect on my journey, it was probably one of the most important things that ever happened to me in terms of where I am today. So when I got cut from the team, I started playing with club basketball. I had a really good experience, but I got immersed in campus life, student orgs, figuring out what resources exist, just being a, a true, um, just, just really being eager to figure out all the resources. I'm someone who's like, you know, you give me multiple things. I'm going to take advantage of every opportunity you provide me. And so I'm going across campus to academic advising, setting up this four-year academic plan. I'm going to career advising, trying to get a resume started. Don't know where to start, but trying to get a resume um, started at somewhere. I know at some point I want to apply for jobs on campus, off campus. I want to do it all. If I'm not going to play basketball. I want to do it all. I had a, a really good year. Um, Enjoyed my time, but made a decision that I wanted to go back and hoop. And so I walked onto the team my, my sophomore year and, and got the opportunity to compete um, in varsity basketball, which was one of the highlights of my life thus far as well. And then one of the things that I really noticed when I was a, a varsity athlete was a lot of my peers didn't know the resources that existed for them across campus. At a Division three campus, we don't exist similar to like what, you know, most power five institutions may have now in terms of resources directly within athletics. You had to go across campus to get those. And so I took a really, I took a leadership role in, in helping the guys on my team and say, okay, you need help with your resume. This is where you need to go. You need help with your what class. This is where you need to go. You shouldn't be doing it on your own. And it kind of opened my eyes to the need for that, these type of resources within, within uh, athletics that kind of led to, to where I am today. And so um, I think that's the foundational component of, of, of like what's my story and where I'm at. And, and it just kind of goes from there. And uh, athletics played a huge role in, in, my development, but also being cut from that team. I think if I didn't get cut, I don't get exposed to, to what resources are, are available that allow me to, to drive this passion that I have now for supporting student athletes at the highest level. I appreciate you sharing uh, the part of the first part of your story you chose to uh, share with us today. And one of the things that I found in my own research was that you walk, got cut your first year, walk on your second year, your third and fourth years, you, you did not play varsity basketball. Now, I'm not going to tell the story for you, but I know you got some news. You made the pivot to clubs, club basketball. But talk to us about that transition as well, because you went, I mean, really in three different spaces from a basketball sense over the course of four years. Yeah. Uh, so um, sophomore year, we had a really – we had a tough season, but we, we exceeded uh, expectations. We made the conference tournament. Um, I went from – I walked onto the team – to like the first 10, 11 games of the season, like constant rotation in the minutes. So more than what I expected the last half of the season, I fell out the rotation, which was still a good experience, but it, it taught me to never, never be complacent. But to that postseason, we're in a workout. I get a call from my aunt and my sister's on the line and I already know something's going on because my aunt just doesn't like randomly call me. So I'm already figuring out, okay, like what, what's happening? And long story short, I find out my mom, has been diagnosed with cancer and my mom didn't want to break that news to me. And it was really tough for her. And so what that did for me was I had to take a step back from, from, from competing just because I had just got my, I just got my own, my first car, uh, had bills to pay my phone bill, things like that. And so for me, it was more important for me to step away from basketball and be responsible and start working. And so I was in school and I had three jobs. I had two on campus and I was working at Foot Locker at the mall um, and so campus only allowed you to maximize certain a certain amount of hours. And so like I did that, I maxed that out. I had a really good job that allowed me to do homework while at work. And so that worked itself out. But like every day after after school, I was driving up to the mall, at the mall to, to go to Foot Locker and go to work. And, and that was just a way to support myself. So I made the conscious decision to step away from basketball because I know my mom couldn't work, um, at least in that in that capacity. Uh, my mom was doing pretty well now for anyone that's tuned into the pod. But um, that that's the decision I had to make. And then. When I talked to coach and I broke down, I'm super honest. I said, hey, listen, this is where I'm at. This is why my decision is what it is. He said, Ahmad, I know you have some interest in, in coaching basketball at some, in some way, shape or form. So I want to offer you a spot as a student assistant on, on our staff. And I took it and I enjoyed it. And that led to a two year GA ship. Uh, with the men's basketball team as well, because uh, something I, I guess I forgot to mention, mention was if you asked me what I wanted to do uh, from an early aspect of my college experience, I wanted to coach college basketball. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be around those 12 to 15 young men every day working on their development. Not so much X's and O's, because I think that's going to take care of itself, but more so like teaching them the like life lessons through basketball. That was that was my um, interest. And then the, the stability aspect of, of coaching uh, collegiate basketball is what deterred me from continuing on that path. 
so of course you have mentors and and coaches, right? Um, even sponsors, you know, your head coach at the time, who helped to in some ways more than others, you know, provide access, right, or increase access to different places and different spaces that you may not have uh, been aware of before. But as you shared, you know, the story with at least with you at Ithaca, both at your undergrad and graduate level so far. I mean, the three words that come out to me, four words that come out to me is like, figure this shit out, right? You you were someone who just figured shit out the way that needed to be figured out in that moment, but then also looking long-term as well. You said your sister was six years older, but how did you begin? I guess, what steps did you take? Or what pressures were you feeling to really figure shit out on that campus? Understanding that your sister was six years older, so right, you, you still didn't have that same, y'all weren't in college at the same time or even a similar time, but it was a new environment, new decisions had to be made. Uh, to not just protect uh, your own peace, but then also to support your family and yourself as well. So how did you begin to figure shit out uh, as an undergraduate, but also as a graduate student, and not just the day-to-day, but then also your career um, to where you thought it would go in the moment? Yeah, my, my support system. I had, I had a great support system, both off campus and on campus. I had a, a, a woman that worked at Ithaca College, and she's still there now. Her name is Yolanda Clark. She was like a second mom to me. She literally took me under her wing. She gave me my first job on campus. She gave me my last job on campus. She helped my development. She literally set me down one day and said, Ma, what do you want to do? And what experience do you need to get there? And whatever experience you need to get there, I'm giving that to you. And she was really intentional. She she created a job for me in grad school when I, when I uh, directed the Emerging Academic uh, and Professional Leaders Program and said, hey, and give me all the experiences you want, and I'm going to give you responsibilities in all those areas. So people really just invested in me. And I think uh, being being a first generation college student um, outside outside of my sister, it was just like, you know, you got to I had to grow up quicker than I than I wanted to. Um, and obviously, there's pros and cons to that. But I think it's just the nature of you, you put me you put me in any situation. I'm going to adapt and, and, and make the most out of it because um, survival is something. I think, you know, people coming from, I come from survivor mode is something that we're forced to be in really early on. And so I've always been in survivor mode, even when things or situations are comfortable. It's like, okay, like I got to make this work for myself. I got to make this sustainable and I got to come out on top. And so um, that mindset coupled with people around me just investing in me. And I think just me just being a genuine person, um, I know how to ask for help. It's, it's, it's been a struggle, but knowing how to ask for help when it gets to that point ha- has been really crucial as well, right? Being able to sit, sit someone down and say, hey, I'm struggling right here. Like, what do I do? How do I get this done? Um, and that's something I had to learn more and more of. But once I began to open my mouth more and more about needing help and needing assistance, people were 100% in my corner, ready to invest in me and propel me to where I am now. And so like, I look at like what I've accomplished thus far which I still think is, is is minimal like I don't get to where I am today without my community externally from my family so people friends um, professors coaches you name it like they're all been a crucial part of, of my development and I'm not here today without them it's real and <laughs> you said you know how to ask for help right and as I'm looking at your LinkedIn right now obviously you went to Ithaca and did some dope shit there went on got your master's was coaching helping the athletes you know a career shit whatever but we're still trying to break into this thing called college athletics. And somehow, some way, and I don't know this story, I actually stumbled upon the ethnic uh, women and minority uh, grant through the NCA. Who put you on? How you find this? Everybody got um, a story. <laughs> yeah. So I, honestly, I got, I got to shout you out too, because 2019 Emerging Leader Seminar in Indy, I get um, my – one of the associate ADs at Ithaca College was like, Ma, you need to look at this program. If you want to work in athletics, you need to look at this. So I applied for it. Arian Roberts, who's the um, associate AD there now, helped me with my applications to make sure that I'm being really intentional with how I answer questions. So definitely got to shout her out. But got get to go to – get approved to go there, right? And it, NCA took care of us. I get out there and obviously like I knew you from social media. And so that's already a face. I'm like, okay, this, this guy's Tim is out there. He's black. He's working there, but also he's Greek. Right. Um, and so that's a connection that I already know. And I don't know if you remember but when I first walked in, like I'm talking about fresh uh, green eyes, like not knowing what to expect is you and Patrick at the door. And, <laughs> and I, I say, what's up to Patrick. I say, what's up to you. And your first thing to me was like, what's your name? Like, wh- wh- like, where are you from? And, and like, what do you want to do in college athletics? And I, I don't, I can't lie to you and tell you, I remember what I, what I, what I said to you in that moment, but what that triggered for me was like, okay, damn, every other moment in these next three days is going to require another level of intentionality mm. that I need to turn my gear up. Right. And so fast forward, ELS is amazing. As you know, uh, I'm back on, on 
working my working full time in res life, but also GA trying to figure out how do I get my foot in athletics. Um, and I'm working with you. If you remember, like I'm working with you on my resume, on my cover letter mm-hmm. to get all that thing, all that stuff polished. And I stumble, I stumble across, I don't know if it was in a job market or just higher ed jobs, but I stumble across this, this, this um, D3 internship catered to women and ethnic minorities. Um, and I applied for it, obviously with the, with the help of you with my cover letter and resume. And I, uh, I don't hear anything back. And so a few weeks ago, I called Jackie Schumann, who was the senior associate AD, and uh, she's now the AD at UMass Boston. Uh, Jackie's been amazing for me, but I called her and I said, hey, um, I'm, well, I'm sorry, I emailed her and I said, hey, my name is Ahmad. I, I applied for this role. Just wanted to reach out, see like where you are. She was like, um, don't remember getting your information. Um, send me your resume. I sent her my resume. She was like, hey, are you free to get on a call in 20 minutes? I'm like, yeah. So we get on a call <laughs> and- Talk about talk about being ready, right? You know, stay yeah. ready so you got to get ready. So we get on the yeah. call, and the first thing she tells me is, um, "We we already interviewed candidates for this role. We already, uh, and I think they had candidates on campus as well." So the, she was like, "I just want to let you know, like, just be transparent. We we've already interviewed candidates for this role, but I seen your resume. and wanted to have a conversation. So it was supposed to be a twenty minute conversation, and we was on the phone for a little bit over an hour. And before the phone hung up, she said, "Ahmad, what's the chance I can get you to campus next week?" And I was like, I'll make it happen. And so, um, you know, tell my folks, whatever, we, we get things organized. I fly out. Uh, they fly me out there for an interview. I meet a lot of people, coaches. Uh, I didn't get to meet students in that interview, but met a lot of uh, staff across the department, but also the, the university. And um, I remember I drove home. Well, I, I fly home that day. And then the next day I had a trip to Jamaica to celebrate my, my uh, graduating from, from grad school. I was going to Jamaica and um, as I'm picking something up, I get a call from Jackie. She's like, Hey, you got time to talk? I'm like, yeah. She was like, well, I want to know if like you want to like join our team. And it just happened that quick. And so, you know, I took the opportunity. I was like, this is my opportunity to get my foot in the door. This role was very intentional about there's no comprehensive student athlete development program that exists right now. So this role that's coming in, you're going to have to build that out mm-hmm. and, and you're going to have to be intentional with how you do it because it's, it's, it's a job that's bigger than one person. And so Amazing opportunity, um, really foundational. I think Jackie is 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 a guru in terms of like student development, and she knows um, what it looks like on very high levels. And so, being able to just work and learn from her, and not often do people, especially at that internship level, have a direct porting line to like number two in the department. And so, what that also allowed me was just to see how operations run and work. And I was able to sit on like exec staff meetings with our AD. And just really learn a lot and just absorb so much. And so that that's how I got my foot in the door. That's how I cracked in. And then from there, it's just kind of, you know, if you go to my Twitter and, and my pinned tweet, it's let the work speak for you. And so I went there and I let the work speak for me. And I think um, I've been truly blessed with the opportunities I've had since since then. Amazing story. And that, yeah, that ELS. I'm so glad I got to come back because that was my first month at Maryland. And somehow, <laughs> some way got to uh, finesse coming back to work that program which is definitely my favorite program outside of PGIP uh, that the NCAA hosts. Uh, but Amal, before we move on to segment two, because <clears throat> it's definitely related, but I want to make sure I'm explicit in centering this in our conversation as well, is that we're, we're both in career development, right? Career readiness, career enhancement, whatever the hell you want to you call it. But as I think about the people that, that have helped me as far as like sponsoring and supervising me, like Didi, Marissa, Risa, Dr. Vache, Dr. Shea, Beth, future Dr. Beth, you talk about your sister, Yolanda Clark, Jackie, obviously Amanda, shout out to Amanda now in UK. Mm-hmm. It's all women. Mm-hmm. It's all women. I told you we were going to talk about this shit. It's all women, right? And I, I talk about a lot on social, right? This shit's personal. And I don't feel as if um, us men are doing our part to um, support, uplift, um, advocate, sponsor for other men in this industry. But you and I are both beneficiaries, if I can speak for you, of women reaching back, reaching across, and pulling us up to places where we can be influential with these athletes. And I just say that right now, I just I want to name that. What, what you thinking? What's on your brain? Very, I'm very much aware of that. Um, I've only had, in my entire life, and I've had a lot of jobs, I've only been supervised by one male. And I don't, I don't really count when I was coaching because it was just a family. Like, it was a coaching environment. I was a GA. I was just hooping. Um, but in terms of just professional opportunities, I've always been supervised by, by women. And I think that speaks to a lot of like how, who I am, 
um, what women mean to me as of today, like growing up in a household, my mom, and my sister, and seeing how they have inspired me on so many levels. Um, and you talk about get, just getting shit done, right? My mom is the, the epitome of get it done. Like I'm talking about you, you, you give her a task. She's going to get it done. She's going to make it happen with, mm-hmm. with nothing or whatever you give her. And so um, like women are, are, have been instrumental in, in my life and continue to be, and definitely shout out to Amanda. Um, like I, I can't say enough good things about Amanda. She's, she's amazing. And so, but like women have been instrumental in my life. And so it's just, it's just, it's the nature. It's kind of what, what, when I think about women, what I associate is, is amazing leadership, um, amazing direction. And um, when you talk about like women leading units and departments and organizations, like I'm, I'm, I'm hundred percent all in, like, I feel extremely comfortable even going back to therapy. Right. I wanted a black woman to be my therapist. I was really specific about that ask and, and figuring that out because of what women have meant to me in my life. Um, and I just value that relationship. And I always look forward to, um, to being able to, to, to uplift and continue to do, to do my part because they've done so much for me. That's good. So segment two, and we're going to, I'm going to come back to this, this one, this gender piece, but also the race as well. And I'm looking at your, uh, your LinkedIn profile again, right? Res life. Cool. Coaching. Cool. Student athlete experience, whatever the hell that means. Catch all academic students. Are, now you hit this career enhancement employer relations. And we don't have to have the research. I don't have it right in front of me, but I can tell you right now, there's not a lot of black men in working in career development uh, offices or in roles across uh, U.S. higher education. So as a black man in career, as the as a black man who's serving as the assistant director of career enhancement and employee relations at Northwestern University, what is your role? What are you doing? What do you purpose? What have you been asked to do at Northwestern? Yeah, um, so I would say majority of my role is student facing. And so a lot of what I do is curriculum development. So we have a four year curriculum for our student athletes to progress through. We all know that development in any any arena isn't always linear, but we have a linear model of career development that focuses on foundational components from our first year um, audience to all the way to seniors and thinking about what does life look like post graduation, whether that's professional sports, graduate school, full time jobs internships, you name it, are they prepared for that living on their own? Um, so I, I'm, I'm charged with, with creating that curriculum and well, more so like revising and updating to make sure that that stays relevant to the times that we're in. Uh, I'm also working with our students on the front line in terms of resume development, career uh, exploration, cover letters, job interviews. So if a student has a job interview and wants to prep on that, I'm working with them to, uh, on how to, you know, talk about themselves good tips and tricks to, to be successful while interviewing and, uh, but also just instilling confidence. Like something I, I said in my interview when I, when I was interviewing for the role, but also share with my students when I got there is like, this is my role, but I'm not, I'm not only here to serve as like the career point person. Like I'm here to be a mentor of all sorts in any way I can. But I, I think one of the things that I enjoy most about my role is just representation. And I, cause I know that career development looks different for student athletes of color for our, our women student athletes, for our international student athletes, looks looks very different, right? So serving in in, 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 a, in a role where I can, you know, encompass multiple identities that allow me to, you know, tell the story, but also speak to some of the challenges and and uh, concerns that our student athletes may have in different realms of, of, of uh, career development. And so, and, and the other component of my role was just a little bit more of the external piece is just helping navigate relationships with alums, and with employee partners. And so you talk about, you know, preparing students for the, for the opportunity. Well, someone has to be, you know, figuring out what opportunities exist out there. And that's more so of my colleague's role, but um, I do some, some, some work in external space as well. And so uh, on a, on a higher level looking in, that's, that's pretty much what I do on a day to day. Yeah. But I think anyone in your role, I want to push back a little bit. Anyone, anyone they would have hired in that role, just like my role will be doing something similar, if not the same thing. Mm-hmm. But as a black man in this role, they're def- I, I'm assuming based on my own experiences, and let, let me not project if it's not true for you, there are things you're considering and thinking about differently. There are methods you may be using that other people across the country are not using and or be aware of for that matter, right? There may be cultural references you may be um, uh, utilizing in your curriculum development, right? Like as a black person, and particularly a black man in career development, how has career deve- your definition of career development evolved over the years or even evolved over the last two years, given that you've been more focused in career enhancement work at Northwest? 
Yeah, I think I think I've been forced to take a more proactive approach and understanding the nuances of how career development looks different based on how you identify. Um, like one of the things that, you know, I, I we, we, we were working to tackle when I first got there was a lot of organizations and companies were still utilizing Zoom interviews uh, to fully select their candidates. Right. And, and there was this big push. Oh, we got to get them back in person. We got to do this. But the research was showing that our black students were more comfortable interviewing over Zoom because it removed a lot of anxiety from walking into an organization or office where no one looked like them or feeling like they had to, um, you know, just be this person that they're not to get to get through this interview process um, and, and, and being able to do that over Zoom in the comfort of their own home or dorm room or whatever space they did provided a lot of comfort. The other thing I think about is, is, is the, the physical features and like how we present ourselves. Uh, I had someone tell me, um, I won't, I won't say their name, but I had someone tell me like, you should, you should really think about cutting your beard. And I'm looking like, what? Like, why, like, why would I think about cutting my beard? Like, just like, what does that mean? But I also think about how, you know, all of these, these, uh, soft rules around facial hair and presentation is always geared towards black people. Right. When you think about your facial hair and, and, and earrings and I wear earrings, I got earrings in right now. And, and so all that stuff that's deemed unprofessional and we got to unpack that professionalism as well. But, you know, working to, to help my students see themselves and see the authentic selves. Like I even think about um, one of the things that we proposed this year was doing uh, like a fashion show and a fashion show geared around and definitely like shout out Julian Jones um, for, for, for chopping it up with me about this, but just having a fashion show to be able to teach our student athletes what it looks like to, to be comfortable in your own skin, but also like making sure that they, they meet those minimum, those minimum, uh, like not qualifications, but standards of professionalism. I, I know we're still trying to debunk that whole term, but it's, it's, it's a structure that exists and it's going to take a while, but teaching them how to, to truly be themselves, right? So don't conform in terms of like cutting your hair or don't feel like you've got to take your, your earrings out um, and things like that. Just, just have it, like allow them to truly just be themselves in the overall experience. So many ways I want to take this. I'm trying to figure out how much time we got, but if not, we got to continue this conversation at M4A. So Ash and them company, if you're listening, make sure y'all uh, y'all pull us through. But I do want to start with <laughs> some good shit. Let's just, let's start professionalism, right? Because I told you before, I think on last week, I don't know if it was on a podcast or a book, probably not a book. I don't like I don't like reading, but the the statement that said that black people have never, I think it was a tweet, that black people have never had the opportunity to define what professionalism looks like, right? Never. And I'm like, damn, that's some good shit. It got me fucking thinking about programming in Maryland and even otherwise um, across the country. But even as I hear you say, and again, for better or for worse, and for better and for worse, right, these minimum standards of professionalism. And so my question to you, and as you're talking with not just our colleagues across the country, but then also with this, the athletes, is like, are we teaching, or should we be teaching how to conform or how to assimilate? And it's not a right, it's not a right or wrong. Should we be teaching them the system and what, like what currently exists and empowering them to make their own decisions? Because either way, there's going to be um, a consequence, right? Positive and, and air quotes negative that comes from whatever decision that they choose to make. But how do we educate? And again, something I'm still learning myself. How do we educate on like how we empower students to make decisions for themselves, given that there's a system structure policies that still want to keep black people, um, or really non-white males, out, non-white heterosexual males out of um, these roles? That's a good question. I think that's something that, it's an ongoing conversation, like you said. But I think it's a, I think it's truly a healthy balance between the two. Like, obviously, you want to be transparent with your students, given you have that relationship to just be open and and honest with them. But you don't want them to to have, feel like they need to, you know, trump the system or just completely do their own thing because the nature of that is it doesn't set them up for success. Um, I think it's it's important to be honest about the structure that exists. Um teach them core components of, of like foundational elements of what professionalism looks like, empower them to make their own decisions, but also provide guidance and, 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 and help them um, in terms of understanding that every battle doesn't need to be won right now. And so I, I think it's, I think it's power and, you know, starting and making progress and letting people behind you or after you continue to push that, uh, I, I refuse to put, this is my own thoughts. And so like, 
I, I refuse to put all the pressure on like my current cohort of student athletes to completely just, you know, do their own thing and go rogue. I think there's uh, some elements of professionalism that I will, I would love for them to, to not conform to, but just understand like why, um it's essential to like just moving forward right now it's not the times that we envision you know moving forward but i think it's it's important to understand that so uh, to answer your question long-windedly i think it's a it's a healthy balance between the two we got to understand that you know one you want to empower them and and, and and guide them in the right direction the two you don't want to ever set them up for failure um but you want to support them no matter what decision they make let's move away from the students and back on us as staff members how are you choosing and, and or how do you choose to push against and a challenge, um, for lack of better words, the fucked up shit that's happening from a career development space across the U.S. higher ed and in the workforce? Um, try my hardest every day to be my most authentic self. And the reason I say try my hardest because it's not always easy. I will say that Northwestern has been one of the places that it, that it has been truly easier to show up every day as my authentic self, which is something I, I don't take for granted. But I think me showing up as, as my true self every day shows students not only that look like me, but from marginalized identities, like you can be yourself in a professional setting. Like you can truly be who you are. Um, I keep my beard the way it is. Um, I trim it when I need to, but I keep my beard how it is. I, I wear my earrings. Um, I, I dress how uh, I like to dress. In, in the office as well. Like I don't, I don't come in every day in a, in a suit and tie. Um, I'm not coming either in sweats, but I'm, I'm coming in and just, you know, you can see my style with what I'm wearing. And, and I hope that in, encourages our students to understand that, you know, you can still be fashionable and dress professionally. You can still express yourself and dress professionally. So little things like that, I hope they just take from, but also in conversations. Um, well, when I, when I'm talking to my students, we have some amazing awards at, at, at Northwestern that we're able to provide our student athletes to embark on these amazing career development journeys. Um, and so for me, that looked like when the time was, when it was time to promote these awards, it was like, okay, I need to sit down with a handful of my black, specifically student athletes, because we need to remove all the barriers of access that have prevented them from applying for these awards in the past. And so mm -hmm. doing little things like that to like show them not only am I here, but I'm, I'm present for you as well to, to be successful. And so um, this is a group effort and I hope that my presence, at least my presence has, you know, made some strides of comfort and um, accessibility and opportunities for them as well. But the, the work is never done. Um, I could do it. I could definitely do a better job. I'm continuing to, to, to be better every day. But that's that's some things I do right now to just, you know, help promote authenticity and just being yourself when it comes to a career development um, space. It's good shit. No, give yourself credit, bro. You don't gotta uh you don't gotta couch that shit. I can you're doing good shit. I mean, again, there's not a to your point, there's not a necessarily even a right answer. It gets to our point, a right answer. But to be honest, a lot of this shit should have been addressed decades ago. Not you know, not even five decades, right? We were barely in higher education five decades ago, but like the 90s, the 2000s. And I have had conversations with people, senior leaders, and I'm like senior black men leaders, and I see them like in meetings. Some wearing earrings, some not. But then I see them out of the meetings and everyone got earrings on. And I legit had to have a conversation with one. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. I said, yo, like, why do you keep, like, you a senior associate AD. You still got your earrings in. Like, baby studs, like mine, right? Actually smaller than these. But I'm like, why? And he went on to say, like, this is my shit, yada, 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 yada. But to your point, like, coming out of undergrad, I'm like, all right, I'm going to take my earrings out when I go to work. I think my first day of my GA, I forgot to take them out. I'm like, well, fuck this. I'm keeping them in. The NCA, I'm like, oh, I'm taking them shits out. Nah, I ain't doing it. So now it came to the point. It's like, yo, fuck it. Like, they're going to stay in, whether you like it or not. Um, and hopefully we get to a point where well, we will get to a point where I think it become more normalized, one. But then, two, we can continue to choose not just our own battles, but how we want to push against the system collectively because it's not going to happen um, in isolation. Um, but I wanted to take us uh, to our next um, topic, which is what y'all are doing in particular at Northwestern. Uh, you and I talked before about, you know, centering diversity, equity, and inclusion in career readiness, uh, programming, curriculum, policies. And from what you had told me offline, like, y'all doing some dope ass shit. You know what I'm talking about as far as the committee anti-discrimination piece. So can you talk to us more and really educate our listeners in regards to what y'all are doing at Northwestern? Uh, because what y'all are doing, I think, is what I know is what other institutions need to follow suit um, on and with to, to best support uh, our non-white, cisgender, heterosexual uh, student athletes in college support. Yeah. Um, I'm super happy to talk about that. I think one of the the initial pieces is like me being brought to Northwestern. I definitely think that that was a pillar in, in how we move forward to 
um, start with the representation piece, right? I think even I told you offline, my presence, I've noticed and I've been told by folks in our student services space, like just my presence there alone has increased the traffic flow of our, our Black student athletes or student athletes of color coming in that space, stopping in the office, whether it's to ask questions about a resume or just to say, hey, I want to introduce myself. Like I had a, fo- a bunch of football guys come in and just say, hey, this is my name. Um, nice to meet you. And and that's, that's dope. That was dope for me, right? Just to see that, you know, they're they're appreciative of, of me being there. And now it's time to get to work. Some of the things we're doing, uh, and I, I think it's really important, is just working with the community. So I won't I won't take credit for it because a lot of this this work has been done before I got there, but we've been moving it forward so since my arrival. We have an anti-discrimination panel with uh, all of our career offices across campus. And so the greater campus career office at Northwestern, um, the law school, our School of Engineering, every career office you can think of across campus, which is a lot at Northwestern, we all come together to create this, this anti-discrimination statement that basically allows us to create a foundation for our student athletes who go on to work, um, different internships and opportunities throughout the collegiate experience. We have a lot of internship for credit programs and you for life specifically, we're working to, to, to place students in internships daily. And so there's a lot of student athletes, a lot of, sorry, a lot of students across campus in general that are, that are embarking on a lot of amazing opportunities. And so this anti-discrimination statement is for not only us, but employers. And it's kind of, obviously we can't control what organizations do. We're kind of giving them the standard of, okay, you're coming to Northwestern to, to, to get the most elite talent in this area, right? And so if you're coming to do that, then we ask you to abide by, by these policies and, and this statement to support our students, to make sure that they have a, a worthwhile experience, to make sure that they're not uncomfortable, to make sure that they're not being discriminated against, to make sure that they're not you know being treated unfairly, to make sure that they have a, a fair interview process, all of those things. And then also we're working to create uh, a reporting a reporting system or structure as well. And so if a student has an experience um, throughout this internship or experience that they feel has been problematic or, or due to like how they identify, they're able to sort of report it, which goes through our office of equity and then also to like the individual who oversees that person. So for example, if it's a student athlete who submits it, it goes to the office of equity and then come back to, to myself and Kibbelian for Life. And then we we tackle that and figure out what's the best way to move forward. Do we want to continue with that employer partner? Do we want to have a conversation? How do we support the student that's struggling throughout this time, right? And so that's some of the things we're doing um, on, on from a collaboration standpoint that I think has worked pretty well. Um, another thing that, that that we're working on right now is uh, education and education from uh, how does career development, I think it's easy to say, right? I think if you say, well, career development looks different depending on how you identify, everyone to shake their head and say, yeah, of course, right? But the, the nuances behind that and how we break that down is really important as well. So for us, we want to make sure that we're going back to your early question, we're educating our student athletes on that and how it looks different, not to discourage them, but to make sure that they're set up for success. I don't want any student to go out into the work field, whether it's an internship or full-time job and be surprised at what they're seeing. And so being able to educate them on how structures operate now, but also um, doing equal work to prepare them for that as well, even though we know sometimes you can't be prepared for a situation you haven't experienced yet, unfortunately. Um, and so those are like two of the key things we're doing to, to make sure that we're supporting career development from a, um, from a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. Oh, and one more thing I'll share is we, we do a mentorship program, and, I, and I'll talk to you about this too. We do a mentorship program, and it's only geared for sophomores because we have other avenues for juniors and seniors, upper class student athletes. But the mentor sign up is extremely detailed. I mean, down to like the the age range of a mentor to how they identify to their sexual orientation to all of those buckets. You wouldn't think it's like am I signing up for a mentor? Or am, am I like signing up for like a life partner almost? And it's, it's like, it's really important because we want to be intentional. And if, if we keep pairing these student athletes of color, these international student athletes, um, these, these, these our women student athletes with mentors that they can't see themselves and that don't align with, with how they think or how they feel. And it's not really supporting them holistically. Then we're doing ourselves a disservice um, and, and supporting our student athletes. So being able to be super, super intentional, I know I've used that word quite a bit, but being intentional about, how we place them and how we pair them with mentors. And so not only do you have a, a relationship for the remainder of the academic year, but it continues to go on moving forward. And then you see the buy-in from people that look like you or identify the same. And so when we reach out to you in four or five years, you're willing to give back and do the same type of involvement for current student athletes in that, in that time. So 
just to highlight a few ways in which I think we're we're making great strides towards supporting our student athletes. I told you before, you're doing dope shit. Y'all are doing dope shit. But before I take it to segment three, I told y'all I'll come back to it and I did not forget. And I'm going to ask, I mean, as explicitly as possible, we benefited uh, from women's presence, women leadership uh, over our time on this earth. And so in your role now, uh, given that women are, are way more educated than us men are, mm-hmm. but obviously still getting paid way less than what they should be and what they have earned, how are you being deliberate in supporting women athletes at Northwestern? That's, that's a real good question. That's a real good question. I think one of the immediate ways I, I think about is just we have a, a women in business mentoring program specifically. And I know it's a very specific avenue, but business, just like athletics, is an is a industry that's dominated by men, right? And if you take a step further, white men, right? And so how do we create a space where women who, like we acknowledge, are, are smarter, are being able to elevate in these roles, be supported? And so that I think that's an effort that, that we're working to support to, to enhance the, the, the presence and support that we provide for our, our women student athletes. Uh, I think another avenue is just when I when I have any opportunity to meet with with uh, what our uh, our women student athletes is really important to just empower them in any way, shape, or form. So we have an advisory board and a, an advisory board. So I operate similar to SAC, and we have one or two reps from each team that work directly with me for the purpose of career development and career enhancement. So this is this is an addition to SAC, and so I get this I get the privilege to work with these thirty five students all the time, and then I have an exec board. And on, on my five person exec board, there are two women in particular, Lily Gilbertson, and Allie Berkeley, shouting them out. And I always try to empower them to step up and lead. Like we have a, an event scheduled for the end of the month uh, for our first years. And they're, they're leading that completely from, from start to finish. All I'm doing is logistical information and they're leading that. And so giving them opportunities to just step up and, and have people observe them in leadership roles, right? So we can be more accustomed to seeing women in leadership. Um, we have a, uh, my unit is, is led by, by women, Amanda, who, who was previously there, but also Jana, who, who's our deputy AD. Um, and so just being able to, to um, work with them and, and ha- has been amazing as well in terms of just support and development. I, I love that. And I, that advisory board is something I'm looking at Maryland, like we might have to, might have to do something similar. We got a different, things hit different, of course, in College Park, because it's just mm-hmm. the student population, demographic, et cetera. Um, but I'm about to say, Oh, yeah, I think like a lot of conversation, particularly on Twitter, right, is about, like, where are our men? Where are, where are our Black male athletes? Where are our male athletes in career development? You've seen this shit. I don't got to reiterate with you. And I always go back to, like, if we just go back to just figure this shit out, right, uh, it'll get done regardless. If none, of, if you and I did not exist in our role, the men would still be okay, right? The people who are opting into our programming, whether it's from a career development standpoint, leadership, identity, career service, whatever, they're opting in because they need and or want that help and extra support. And so it's, it should not be a surprise that our women are coming to see us. But to your point, us, you and I both continue to not just acknowledge our male privilege, but also our power and helping to elevate and empower them to take on the world, but also removing those barriers uh, before they reach them, I think is what uh, I commit to and hope that we can commit to together as well. Absolutely. It's essential. Well, mandatory. Yeah, I like that. Man, it's mandatory. It might be the title of the pod, bro. It's, it's mandatory. Crazy. It is. I like that. Nice. I like that. mandatory. I like that. I like that a lot. Man, uh, segment three. It's mandatory. Um, how can I, but also our podcast community, best support you uh, in your life journey, right? Your career journey. What, what can we do? Yeah, I, I'm not gonna lie to you. This was the question that was the hardest to to <laughs> like when I when I seen the email. This is the one that was hardest to think about. Um, but I will share one of the things that that's been on my mind is just. And I've tweeted it before and I've retweeted my own tweets intentionally before for this reason. Uh, I just want everyone, because I know, I mean, the, the pod touches in a variety of audiences, right? But I, I think it's fair to say that the majority of the audience comes from the college athlete, college uh, uh, sector of what we do, right? And so I think one of the things that's really important to me is understanding that we compete in every NCA sport. And it's okay for a competition and be competitive. But when we talk about impact in the lives of student athletes in a variety of ways, we're all on the same team. I think it's important to know that, right? Because I think so much information is gatekept. People want to be secretive of what they're doing. Um, They want to be the only one that's doing it. 
uh, or they just want to look good for, for whatever, you know, social media platform they're doing it for. But understand that we're all trying to come together, um, whether you're in communication, student athlete development, academics, compliance, sponsorships, name, image, and likeness, no matter what it is, we're all, we have one goal, and that's to enhance the student athlete experience, no matter what you do. And so making sure that we all just come together and, and, and continue to support that, but also on a high school level, on a, on a professional athlete level, all of that, like, let's share what we're doing and, and be more collaborative because i think we're stronger together uh it's a cliche but we, we truly are and we're all doing the same thing like no matter what school you're at um like we're all working uh to to, to create these structures of uh, empowerment um development and just world-class students and people going into the world i like that ass but you didn't answer the question bro <laughs> what can we do to support you what can i do to support you what can our podcast community uh do to, to support you right be selfish not even selfish like this, this is your shit what can we do to support you we're gonna share the work we're not gonna get, get uh gatekeep information but uh, my boy ab what's up what can we do what can i do uh yeah this is this is tough um what 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 can uh, the podcast community do to, to support me Specifically, I think keep me in your prayers. Like I'm, I'm, in, I'm in this, I'm in this uh space where like I'm loving what I do every day. Um, and I, I don't know what the future holds. Um, I just want to continue to 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 make impact on a variety of people and spaces. So I would say to keep me in your prayers. Um, I've been in a really good space as of lately, therapy, hooping, um, just healthy family myself. So just just keep me in your prayers and, and, and continue to um, like push the culture and, 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 you know, elevate the work that's being done across the board because um, it's great work that's being done. And so um, I hope I answered the question that time. It's a little tough. Uh, I feel like, you know, weeks, a few weeks down the line when I, when I, um, you know, when everything is live, I, I might, you know, quote, tweet it and share something else, another update. But right now, I think that's, that's the, the most important thing. Just, you know, keep me, keep me in your prayers. Cause I, cause I've been truly blessed and fortunate to do everything I love doing. Um, but I'm, I haven't scratched the surface of where I want to be. And so. Amen. Amen. Am I, uh, so before we bounce, I have a few questions for you and. Our guests this, this uh, season have struggled for whatever reason. I don't think you're going to struggle with these. Um, but first question, your favorite sports memory? Sports memory? Yep. Like me playing or just watching or just either? Playing, watching. Yeah, playing or watching. One you heard of, heard about. Uh, playing was easily my first college basketball game. Um, I'm talking about you talking about somebody who walked into the team. I got the whole community with me. And so I'm saying we had, we got good tennis at our basketball games at Ithaca, but I'm not going to lie. Like when, when, when the year I played, like all my boys and my people would show up every game. So there was like always a section in the crowd where you look across like, yeah, that those, those are my people's right there. Right. And so for those, those 10 to 12 minutes, I was in the game. I'm talking about locked in, you know, my people was there. And so like, I think about that. Cause that's, that's a, that's a dream I got to live out yeah. and then the, uh, an experience I watch and enjoy. I remember I was um, on a plane in 2016. I was, my sister had finished, uh, my sister had finished graduate school in 2016. And so I was out there for her graduation and on the way back, um, just my luck. I was flying back during the 2016 NBA finals game mm -hmm. seven. Mm -hmm. right and so I couldn't get the game and I was sick because I think I was on a jet blue flight and I got the tvs on the back and for some reason we were like bought the land and the, the service went out but this lady across from me seeing me watching the game and seeing my face when like I lost it and like had her the, the game up on her laptop some way turn her laptop to the left so I can so I can see it and we've shared the moment where we watch you know Bron do what he do and I got off the plane and called my dad. I was like, yeah, it's lit. Like, and that's when my dad converted to like a LeBron fan. And it was just, so that was dope for me to, to experience that in the whole situation of where I was at, um, not being able to sit still and, you know, having this high mom's talking about, go get your bags and back. I'm like, nah, I got to call everybody. LeBron just want to chip. So um, yeah, that, that, that's definitely number one for me. Yo, that block. I, I definitely, when he, when he was on the floor, it took me out. Mm -hmm. As an Ohio native, that shit took me out, bro. Uh, top five artists 
All time, your rank. No order, just top five. All right, so I'm going to preface this with saying I'm going to get a lot of heat for this because I'm not like a, a music historian. I'm like, if it like if it, if I, if I my ears like it, then I, I love it, right? And so I got to go Drake, right? Drake is, is, is my goal. I'm definitely going 50 Cent. I grew up on 50 Cent. I'm talking about The Massacre, all of that, right? Just CD and my CD player after school. I remember rapping uh, 50 Cent lyrics in, 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 my, in my dad's crib one day and um, in his white man's world, I'm similar to a squirrel. You finish the line, right? My dad heard that, crack my CD. So I had, I had to start hiding, like listening to music around my pops. Um, so Drake, <laughs> Drake um, and, and, and then 50, uh, Michael Jackson, because uh, just a classic for me. And then I got to go with uh, Alicia Keys. Uh, Alicia Keys is just super dope to me. And then I guess if I uh, top five in terms of. Um, who's the fifth person I, I would include in there for my top five. And it's people I listen to the most. Uh, actually, let me take Alicia Keys out because. She's like a personal favorite, but she's not in my top five. I'm going to replace it with Beyonce because I listen to a lot of Beyonce because I think Beyonce just got classic for days and people could debate that. So I got Michael Jackson, Beyonce, Drake, 50 Cent. And then um, for number five, I got to go. Uh, That's tough. It's tough. I know I got unpopular music opinions. Um. Sheesh. This is tough. Little Wayne. Yeah, so Wayne Drake, 50, um, MJ and Beyonce. Um, that that's that's my five. Um, the people that that get constant rotation in my ear. Um, definitely Drake though. Like every time I do the music, you know, rewind for the year. Like Drake is the winner by like hours on hours on hours. And so like Drake the GOAT. If you're hearing this, Drake the GOAT, and that's not up for debate. Uh, Drake and LeBron are both the GOATs. I and I'll argue that against anybody. But this yeah. man said, this man said 50 Cent. We're going <laughs> Yeah, I grew up on 50 for real. Like I, I can't get rid of that because 50 hey. was it made me love music. Oh, <laughs> uh, that, that's real. That's real. That is super real. Next question for you though. If you could go to brunch. Bottomless brunch, you plus five people. Who you bringing? Oh. Who you inviting? They could be living, they could be deceased. Any point in history. Yeah, five people. You plus I'm, five. I'm, I'm me plus five. I'm bringing Brian. Brian, Brian is a one since day one. Um, Brian. Sheesh. Maya Moore. Brian, Maya Moore. I think I guess I gotta go, I gotta uh, throw Drake in here just because that's that's my guy. Um so I got three right now. Uh Rihanna, mm. that's selfishly, um, and then number five. Can we include family? Yeah, anybody? My pops. Mm. Yeah. So, because my pops, that's my boy, and I and I know we 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 just gonna have a good time. Um, so me, and my pops, uh, Drake, Bron, um. I said Rihanna, right? Rihanna and Maya Moore. Maya Moore, yeah. Maya Moore selfishly because um like she just she, I mean, her story just don't get told enough. Um, and like not not to ex- exclude it, but like forget, like not not even thinking about what she did, like in terms of just like using her platform the right way. People forget, like when she was on a court, dog. she was a dog, like no one could touch her, no one was rocking with her, and so um, I just strive to be that bully every time, even though like I was never the the, the greatest player, just you know, trying to outwork people. And Maya Moore was outworking people, but also the, the best player on the floor whenever she stepped on. And so 
selfishly, like I would, I would love to, um, to break bread with her. It's good. Last question for you. Who do you want to see and or hear from on the walk with TLB podcast? Mm. Who should, who should get on the pod? Um, Julian Jones, obviously, you know, Julian, um, Julian is, is big bro. Um, but I think outside of just like just being an amazing person, he's doing a, a, a lot of great stuff um, and, and kind of setting a precedent. He's kind of you know, like I, I remember we, you had uh, like Courtney on here earlier and uh, just talking about his his um, ability to, to climb the ladder at a, at a fast pace. And I think Julian is someone who's also doing that and making a it's kind of creating a standard of like we don't have to wait all this time to, to be elevated. Right. You just got to be ready when the opportunity presents itself. And I think he's a he's a clear example of that. So I would love to see see Julian um, on, on the pod. Honestly, I think a lot of people who I would have mentioned, you already had them on here. Marissa, um, Sherrod, people like that that I know, like I would love to listen to, the, to them speak about like their experiences. Like you've had them on here in some capacity. And so like, that's just been dope to, to, to take a second to give you your your flowers. Right. Um, like this, this platform has grown tremendously over the last few years. And it's, it's like a privilege to, to be here and have this conversation. Like, obviously we talk offline, but like just to do it, um, you know, on this platform, it, is, it makes it much more special. And so I definitely truly appreciate that. Appreciate you, dog. It's community work. Wouldn't be here without y'all, without us, without us. Um, but before we log off, hit the leave button, anything else you want to share with the people? Um, few things. Lakers will win a championship this year, so talk to me in June. Um, anyone who wants to collaborate on anything, I'm more than happy to do so. I'm still learning and growing, so really, you know, let, let's tap and let's do some good work. Um, it's, it's like 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 Tim said, it's community work, so I'm looking forward to continuing that. Um, and let's just continue to be great and, and be ourselves. Let's strive to be ourselves every day. I know it's not super easy to do, but let's. Let's work on that. Um, and I, I'm just super happy to, to continue to be doing what I love every day. And so I really appreciate everybody who tapped in and listened to like the episode all the way through to this point. I really appreciate y'all. So thank you. We appreciate you too, Ahmad. Um, your birthday, what, August 8th? Around that time? Like August that. 8th. What, what is that, Leo? Leo, yes, sir. I guess y'all, y'all decent. Y'all decent. Y'all cool people. But you posted on August 8th, 2019. <laughs> you don't know where I'm going with this shit. But you said people do not become people do not decide to become extraordinary. They decide to accomplish extraordinary things. Remember that? I do. I'm trying to find a post myself. 24th birthday, bro. And I share that to say to you, um, you're doing extraordinary shit. Right. And the words of Jay-Z, I can't call him directly, but he's not an ordinary, not an ordinary dude, but you're an extraordinary dude. So keep doing what you're doing. You put Northwestern on the map, not just because of what you're doing, but because of your presence at the institution. So thank you for uh, opting into it uh, and opting into walking in your purpose each and every day. Yes, sir. Love, love is love. Love is love, bro. For everyone else, thank y'all again for tuning in to another episode of Walk with TFB. Um, just a few more episodes left this season before we take a short hiatus. Uh, but as Amaya said, we appreciate you tapping into another episode. I look forward to having more unfiltered conversation with authentic people centered on education and sport as we progress through season four. But as always, until then, walk with me.